Back to One is sponsored by Utopia, distributor of We're All Going to the World's Fair. A quiet teenager becomes obsessed with a creepy online role-playing game as fantasy and reality begin to blur. An official selection of the 2021 Sundance Film Festival, IndieWire called We're All Going to the World's Fair an auspicious, wildly smart narrative feature debut. Opening theatrically in New York City April 15th at BAM and Quad Cinema before expanding to theaters nationwide and on digital platforms April 22nd. For tickets, visit We're All Going to the World's Fair.com. I always look at it like this audition might be my only time to get to do this performance. So I'm going to really enjoy it and I'm going to go for it. And that's what I do. And then I have no regrets. And if I don't get it, I don't get it, you know. And then if I do, that's great. But I, I definitely given, have given myself, because I enjoy the work so much. So I work on the accents, I work on the character. I do all of that for the, for the auditions. And then I feel I've had a really great time. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Fiona Glass-Scott is an actor. She sat down with me in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, to talk about the work. What do you need initially to begin to kind of wrap your arms around a new character? Do you have a typical way in? It's all in the script. It's all in the writing. And reading the script, the initial first read, I think, is is so telling because it, it's like you're watching the movie, watching the play, because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I try and avoid the breakdown that comes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, um, the summary or whatever. The summary. Yeah. And I try sometimes to avoid a lot of the stage directions, the ones that tell you how to act. Mm. <laughs> I don't like On those. On your first read. I try and skip them because, yeah. because once I've read it, Mm. then it's kind in of my mind in and I yeah. don't like that, you know, wow, because yeah, I think yeah. it takes away from where you want to go with the performance. And m- most, gr- well, all great writers, really good writers, don't like ri- write like that. But sometimes every now and then you'll get something. And particularly the, the direction that says she cries, she weeps, it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy because it is so difficult to then look at that scene again and not think is she why would she why would she is she be crying or why should she i mean that is such a difficult thing because for, for i think for for that sort of emotion to be really believable it has to be very carefully placed and it is not necessary as right. much as we see it right. i believe yes and uh giving an actor the opportunity to feel in the... Because that's an in-the-moment thing. Right. Do you know what I mean? I I feel very much. And certainly the people I watch that get me, um, it looks to me like it's very in-the-moment, but I don't know what their process is, you know, Mm -hmm. so I'm going to listen to your (laughs) podcast to find out. (laughs) (laughs) But but it begins with the script. It's It's all in the script. And then the initial read and... Quite, quite often I'll get a, a feel for the character, not just in what the character says, but the rhythm of how they speak, how they relate to the other characters, how the characters relate to them. You know, that'll be very clear. And then I, I find out what, I find out, actually, I, I do find out what the accent is before I read it, so that in my head I've, I've got that, that beginning voice even if I you know haven't done the accent before right. and I need to study it to get it right it's just it's just good for me to have it in my ear mm. while before even doing it out loud just just while I'm reading it you're kind of hearing the words just like we do all, everybody does when they're reading but you're hearing it in the proper accent that's what you mean um I think yes but I think what it is is it sometimes it changes the rhythm mm. of mm-hmm. the way something might be said mm-hmm um, and I just like to find out what it is, have that, just have it in my mind that this person is 
British or Australian or Irish, um, where they're from, yeah. you know, and that just just that little bit, and then read it, and then go into if what the, the other ask look for the other um, answers about the character that aren't in the script, mm-hmm. and then the, yeah, then the work really begins, which I absolutely adore. Yeah. You know, um, conversations then with the director and the physicality of the character, where they're from, you know, their experiences. It all, it all adds up, and then you, and then you. I personally uh, learn the lines, and it takes. I like to take a lot of time. So before before doing a play, I'll I'll do at least two weeks, maybe three weeks beforehand, because I want to have them as much off in a very sort of well, I, I want I, I you know I believe you have to come with something to the table. You've got to bring something into the room, and then you bring it in, and you you sit down, you, you sit down, you read, you offer it up, and then it all. Not always, but it all changes because you don't know what's coming to you from the other actors. Mm-hmm. You don't know what the director is going to say. You don't know if you're filming what the weather's going to be like, you know, what the weather's supposed to be like as opposed to what it is. You mm-hmm. know, please stop shaking for a second and uh, all of those kind of things. Um, and then, because I find with the, with the lines, they get, they just can get, for me, they just get in the, they just get in the way. They get in the way of that flow, and mm. I want to know them so I've forgotten them, so they don't become yeah. lines anymore. They just become how people speak, and and then they they get as it happens, they get changed a right, lot. Right, That's right. not a problem. And on stage, I've had with new plays, huge chunks gone, <laughs> new chunks put in. But the worst part is when a, a little bit of a sentence is changed, like a word or two. Oh. And then you're in front of an audience and you're coming up to it and your brain is going and the other actor's looking at you and you're both, uh, you know, (laughs) your eyes are wide and your brain's going, no, there's something about this next bit. What is it? Am I, am I, what is it? Is something in? Is it gone? And you just take a deep breath and you just go for it. And more often than not, it comes out the way it's supposed to come Mm. out. Mm. And then you both sort of blink and keep going. But at the end, it's it's at the end of the, that performance. It's like, whoo, and then you you never worry about it again. I think sometimes in around areas of scripts where there's confusion or you're having trouble getting them into your head, they're usually the bits that, for some reason, you're not emotionally connected to, and sometimes that's because a job for you and your director to talk about and sometimes actually the lines need to change mm. mm-hmm. and that's where the, the incredibly talented writers right and that's that their, must be a hard decision to make like do, does this need the change or is it just that they're not getting it down enough yet i i think the great the great thing about this business is it's a it's a team business and mm. mm-hmm. people respect the actor's work very much and i have found and this hasn't been with plays really but but working on tv and and films that if it just if it's just not right for the character because you well you have to stand up for your character like it's a real person like it's your best friend because nobody else will at a certain point and they shouldn't have to because they you know got different jobs to do Mm -hmm. their own characters the overall arc of the story There's a lot going on. So you need to stand up for your person. And I have found that when I have just been completely convinced that this is not the right thing, and that I'm talking about the wrong word, or she wouldn't say this, or she I really don't think that this is because, you know, such and such happened in her life, if we're dealing with a real person like Judith Jones, or in a book, or I, you know, if you look at this, this would suggest that. And I have always they have agreed. Um, mm. Because I'm not saying I don't like it. I think it maybe you know what mm-hmm. I mean. I'm saying I actually I don't think that this is the right thing, and it's never huge things. And and I've been very lucky to work with great people who are really open to that collaboration. Right. You know. Yeah. 
Yes. Because respecting the writer's work is, is paramount. That's where it all begins, I, I feel. And then right below that want. should be the actor who is embodying that character. And that should be respected. Like you should be able to say, this wouldn't come out of this person's mouth or let's talk about this. Yeah. And I, I mean, you know, and you'd be, uh, you know, obviously very respectful and have a conversation about it and say, you know, what do you think? Let's all have a conversation. And it's important to always be open to listening yeah. and the team. We're together. Right. This is not a, 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 a job that you do on your own. You can't possibly do this right, on your own. Right. Even a one woman show, right. you've got to have other people involved or it doesn't happen. Right. So, right. you know, it's important to work as a team and respect each other and listen. Um, but it's, it's, and that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. And I'm very lucky that most of the work I've done, that has happened, which has been really, really great. And I have to say, I don't often say, you know, no. it's not something I, I, I don't read a script and go, well, I want to change this. I don't at all. I don't at all, because that's where I, you learn everything about the mm -hmm. whole story is from the script. And speaking of Judith Jones in Julia, yeah. uh, I'm loving this series. I'm oh. on episode five, I think. Uh, but, you know, in episode two, a scene with you got me thinking about something I want to talk to you about. The scene in the conference room. Uh, episode two, where you, we first learned that your character is also about to edit um, um, a, a Updike. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it was about tone. It was about like how it's so fascinating to me, even though I'm, I'm sometimes involved in small ways in productions. And I, so I, I know maybe more than the general audience about this kind of thing, but I'm still kind of baffled about how, um tone is set you know um because this this show has a certain tone that feels very consistent and it feels like it's almost a precarious thing because if it gets to be too serious it breaks up this kind of light thing that's happening and if it gets too light it won't have the impact that a lot of these these moments have mm. and i'm just curious like how is that set when you when you were reading this script did you imagine a certain tone go and talk to the director and then somehow it changes or does that all work out when you're first there uh on the set on the first day uh and start to realize it or you know in a rehearsal process or something like that i'd love to know that specifically for a show and specifically for this show and maybe you could talk about that scene. Where, where I'm with all the men and, and Judith Light. And, and Judith Light, Gosh, yes. There's some kind of dynamic between you two in that scene, you know, that, that could be played differently and it wouldn't be as effective. Is that making any sense? How, how do you decide on that, on how to play that? It's in the script. But for that scene in particular, so like before the pilot, there was a rehearsal. There were rehearsal days mm. because we were creating this. But then for the rest of it, then you have you have a read through. Yeah. And but really, it's you know when we we get in the room, we do it. And for me, it's just it's it, it was all it's all in the writing and then in the performances. She is a genius and inc so experienced. And uh, that was our first scene together. Ah. Oh, I love Judith. She's so incredible. And, you know, we have a nice little chat and she's instantly warm and fabulous. And we go in and you, you just run the lines, um, first of all, standing. So, you know, everybody knows what they're saying. And then the director says, OK, Fiona, we want to put you here. Judith, we want to put you there. And let's 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 do it. And then you get to do it, which is great fun. That scene, and then it's, you know, finessed by the director, but yeah. by doing it, it's like I said before, all the preparation, and I can't speak for anyone else, because as you brought up earlier, everyone is so different in their preparation. Yeah. The way I prepare, I'm so prepared. I'm so prepared so that in that moment of, right, let's do it, first rehearsal, it can just happen. 
And what I mean by happening is I don't have to worry about any lines, yeah. accent, everything. Yeah. Everything's done. Everything's ready. And what it's what it is is a conversation. And then I I, I go in and I do it, and and everything it suddenly becomes what it's supposed to be because of the other person, mm -hmm. because of the person I'm talking to, mm -hmm. and because of Judith Light's fabulous performance as Blanche, that informs the tone of the scene as well. Right. So it's the writing the preparation, whatever you do yourselves, but in the moment that all comes together and then it just, it just happens. Can we talk about what I imagine must be a really interesting process that you had to go through for Fantastic Beasts, having to kind of watch a performance, uh, Maggie Smith's performance, and uh, and kind of have to almost study it in order to play this character at, an, at a young age. Not just the accent and the mannerisms, but I'm assuming even her performance. But you don't want it to be mimicry. Like, is, is, this, is this working muscles you don't usually work as an actor? It's not the way I would usually get into a character because I would, because it's usually just on the page. But it was very exciting because it's a bit like the preparation I did in, in some ways for Judith Jones because Judith Jones is on the internet. Oh, interesting. Which is amazing. Yeah. So I was able to watch her. And watching Maggie Smith, oh, extraordinary performance. I get butterflies every time I think about her. I can feel nervous again. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a good way. Because it's about the essence of the character, whether it's a real person like Judith Jones and, you know, reading about her, learning about her, reading her memoir was so helpful, but actually being able to watch and listen to the real person and studying the essence of that person. And that's what's, mm. that's what the performance is. So it's not mimicry right. at all because I'm not a mimic, but it's about finding the essence. And it's just a different way into it. And I really enjoyed it. So when you're talking about Professor McGonagall, it was kind of when it came to watching Maggie Smith's brilliant performance, it was the same thing. But what she does is so genius and it's so funny and it's so much fun to do that it was, it was really enjoyable the way she walked, the way she held her hands, the way she you know, held her head and her face. But those things are, those things are actually things that you quite often you'll find in a script yeah. that are given to you. Um, that might be just something that I imagine reading it, or they might actually be facts about mm -hmm. the person. Mm -hmm. You know, they walk you know, straight backed and, you know, purse lipped and, you know, right. this is this person is, you know, never lets their hands rest or whatever it is, or very animated. Those things will often be in a script and be handed to me anyway. It just happened to be a visual way of doing that. And then it's about taking those and making it the, the younger version yeah. of, of, of her and making it recognizable enough but not a copy yeah. because you're 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 taking the essence and you're taking that list of character or physicality um items let's say i can't yeah. think of the word traits traits thank you <laughs> those 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 traits that i would get from a script anyway yeah right and putting that into the, the and then doing doing my work with it, doing my work that I would always that I would usually do. Yeah. But I just happen to be able to get it through my eyes yeah, watching as opposed to getting it from the page mm -hmm. and then making it up myself. But then you have to then it's then it's the work and the and the accent and the voice. And then you do all that work and then you get there and then you're all you are is, you know, in the scene. You don't you know, when you're when you're performing it, you know you don't you don't play the character, you don't play the accent, you don't play yeah. anything. You just play the scene. Mm -hmm. So you've got all of that done, all that person. Me, I I do this. Actors, other actors work differently. And then on the day, 
you're just in the scene, you're in the moment, you're having the conversation, you're dealing with whatever the issue is or the non-issue or whatever it is, whatever is happening, and you're just right. talking. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it was just a different way of getting to the point where I would usually get to anyway. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. Judith, though, for me, she's such an extraordinary woman and such a joyful human being. If you watch her on YouTube, she's got such an amazing, generous, warm energy mm-hmm. and very funny, witty, interested in people. And watching her, you get so much, I mean, it's such a gift that it was on YouTube, the way she listens to people, her interest in them, all these things Mm -hmm. build up to create a a person, because you're not trying to create a character, you're trying to create a person, (laughs) you know, a real person. And being on a huge studio set like that is just amazing. It's so exciting. You know, it's You don't get overwhelmed. No, I get really excited. It's so so exciting. You know, taking five days to shoot one scene, and I've done lots of films where I'll do five scenes in one day, you know? I mean, it's, it's, that's just the way it is at Brooklyn. We did like lots of scenes in in one day, all those table scenes that we did in one day, and you know, yeah, it's just, it's exciting. I love it. I love my job, and I'm so grateful that I get to do it. I love it, love it, love it. Do you have a certain way you look at, you know, Hollywood now that you have for years been both working on that side of the pond and over here? Do you feel like you need to be over here more because of some kind of momentum or something or career momentum or something like that at a certain point? No. Also, business has changed in how things are auditioned. Mm. Everybody goes on tape, so you don't have to be anywhere. And then you have Skype, like for Judith, for Julia. Oh, my goodness. I'm never going to be able to say the show properly. It's hilarious. Um, You know, I I went on tape. A couple of days later, I, I spoke to Daniel and Charles on Zoom. And they showed my tape to the studio as, as I didn't have to come over. And then I got the job. It was great. Yeah. And I did not set foot in America until we started filming. And I didn't meet them in person until then. That's where we are in the business. And I think that's wonderful because that means people can live the life they want to live, where they want to live. Yes. Um, It's not this idea of like, got to be around for meetings and all this and all this stuff anymore, I guess. Yeah. But I've never been like that. I've never, that's never been something that's been on my mind, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, it's just work, auditions, y- y- you know, script, new scripts, whatever. It's it, the, the other side of it is never something that I thought about as being part of my job at all, actually. Mm, yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it just never has. And maybe that's because I, 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 I grew up in Ireland and I work in Ireland and England, and I've been very lucky to travel around the world to work, which has been one of the joys of this job. Um, no, it's, I've never felt like I have to be in a room talking to people. I've always felt that the work speaks for itself. I would hope. Is there one role that you would beat people up <laughs> to try and get to play? Um, and I'm thinking more on the stage, I guess, but I mean, I mean, any classical role. I don't know. I find that such a hard question because there's so many, and it's one of those questions when I'm so asked, you would beat I completely go blank. A lot of blank. people up. You're saying <laughs> you're saying you would beat. A I am lot. ready <laughs> to uh, get my boxing gloves on. Um, I can't. I just. Violent, I can't. No I can't, violence. No violence. No, no violence. Yeah, I'm not a very violent person, but <laughs> I will. No, I just. I. I don't have a particular one in mind because I just don't know what comes up, what speaks to me at a particular time with the right people that I'd want to work with. I don't know. You already I, played Nina in. A I have. That was amazing. Yeah. Also, I think that might be difficult if you didn't get to play the part when you were at the right yeah. stage to play it? Is yeah. that something that you'd regret later? That's a terrible way to live yeah. your life. Yeah. And this business, because it's, you know, you, 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 most of the time you don't get the job. Right. 
Most right, of the time you right. don't. Even right. the people who are, you know, the, the most famous actors in the world, like yeah. they're all up for jobs all the time. And, and most of the time you don't. That's part That's of right. our job. That's part of our job. Um, right. And I always look at it like this audition might be my only time to get to do this performance. So yeah. I'm going to really enjoy it. Yeah. And I'm going to go for it. And that's what I do. And then I have no regrets. And if I don't get it, I don't get it, you know. I love that. And then if I do, that's great. But I, I definitely give, have given myself, because I enjoy the work so much. So I work on the accents. I work on the character. I do all of that for the, for the auditions. And then I feel I've had a really great time. That's amazing. I really enjoy it. And then I get on with my day. And then I get on with the next one, or I go to go and do the next job and whatever. Um, so I don't want to be hampered by things because I, also, what if you really went for it? Like you know, what do you want if you wanted to do Nora in in, in a doll's house, and you just sort of you? I feel like you could be missing out on things that might be really great for you at that stage of your yes. life if you just constantly are stuck in this yeah. tunnel vision. I don't, I don't know if that's healthy, I would be worried about missing out on the things that are actually happening in the moment. Yes. Fiona Glass-Scott, thank you so much. Thank you. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.